welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Euclidean domains. Okay, so in this video what we're going to talk about is the Euclidean algorithm, which is something that can be applied in an arbitrary Euclidean domain. Okay, now this isn't to be confused with the division algorithm, which is part of the definition of a Euclidean domain, however it does stem completely from the division algorithm. Okay, so you may well have seen or even learnt the Euclidean algorithm in the context of classical arithmetic, in the context of the integers before. We're now going to generalise it, we're going to apply it to an arbitrary Euclidean domain. And the fact that this can be applied in an arbitrary Euclidean domain is the reason that the Euclidean domain is called the Euclidean domain. Okay, so let's get to it then. Okay, so the way I'm going to approach this is um, I'm going to show you the Euclidean algorithm in action first. So I'm going to show you how to do the Euclidean algorithm first, and it will spit us out a number right at the end, and I will say that this number is extremely important. Uh, we'll then do an example, and then we'll understand why that number is extremely important, and we're going to see that it's the greatest common divisor, and we'll look at the proof as to why it is the greatest common divisor. Okay, so, uh, what we're going to start off with then is what is the Euclidean algorithm then? So let me show you the Euclidean algorithm. So to do the Euclidean algorithm, you're going to need two elements from your Euclidean domain, and we're going to pick two non-zero elements from the Euclidean domain. Okay, uh, it's just trivial if you do it with the zero element, so we'll take two non-zero elements. Okay, so we pick A and B from the Euclidean domain, and both of them are non-zero. So let me now show you how to perform the Euclidean algorithm. Okay, so we start by performing the division algorithm, and really the Euclidean algorithm is just the division algorithm repeated again and again and again and again, okay, and it's going to amazingly spit us out the greatest common divisor of these two. Okay, so what we can do then, applying the division algorithm in a Euclidean domain, is we can write A as some multiple of b, okay, so some quotient times b, and I'll call this quotient q0, because we're going to have lots of quotients in the Euclidean algorithm, so I'll call this one, I'll index this one q0, and then plus some remainder, and again I'll index the remainder, so I'll call it r0 here. Okay, so that's perfectly valid, we can always do this because we're working in a Euclidean domain. Now either a will be a perfect multiple of b, in which case the remainder will equal zero, okay, and if that was the case you would stop the Euclidean algorithm right here. You would have already done it, okay, you'd finish the Euclidean algorithm at that, okay. However, if a is not a perfect multiple of b, you will have a non-zero remainder here, and in that case you're going to continue the Euclidean algorithm on. Now, if that is the case, what can we say about that remainder? Well, the fact that we're working with the Euclidean domain and the Euclidean size function tells us that the size, the Euclidean size of R0 is strictly less than the Euclidean size of B here. Okay, so that's what we know if R0 is not equal to 0. So let's assume R0 is not equal to 0, and let's go on to the next step. If R0 was equal to 0, you would stop with A is equal to Q0 times B, and that would be your Euclidean algorithm finished. Okay, but let's assume that that's not the case and go on. Okay, so if that's not the case, what I can now do is I can now do the equivalent thing that I did with A and B here, now with B and R0. Okay, because of course B is non-zero, and R0 is non-zero, so I can now just update myself. I can, instead of thinking about A and B, I can do it with B and R0. Okay, so just go along with the game at the moment, even though you might not fully understand where the game's going to lead us, but just go along with the game, okay? You can't stop me doing this. Okay, so what I can now do is I can say, okay, let's write B as some quotient, which I'll call Q1, times R0, plus a new remainder, which I'll call R1 here. Okay, so B is equal to Q1 times R0 plus R1 here. Okay, and again, we have two options. Either B was a perfect multiple of the first remainder, or the zeroth remainder, maybe I should call it, so that we don't get confused. Okay, in which case this remainder R1 uh, would be zero, or it wasn't a perfect multiple of R0, and therefore we'd have a non-zero R1. If that is the case, we can say something about R1, and we can say that the Euclidean size of R1 is strictly less than the Euclidean size of R0. 
Now, if b was a perfect multiple of r0 uh, and r1 was 0 here, uh, then you'd stop the Euclidean algorithm at that stage. So you're always going to go on and on until you eventually get to this point where you have something as a perfect multiple of the other thing. That's basically the gist of what we're going to do with the Euclidean algorithm. But don't worry if you don't understand, I'll continue the explanation on. Okay, so if it's not the case that we can finish the Euclidean algorithm on this second line, if it's not the case that b is a perfect multiple of r0 here, then r1 will be non-zero, but we can say at least this inequality is true. And now what we can do is we can do the equivalent thing with r0 and r1 here, because both of these are non-zero, so we can now apply the uh, division algorithm to them. Okay, so we can say r0 is going to be some multiple, so we'll have q2 here, times r1, plus another remainder, which we'll call R2 here, okay? Uh, and again, either R0 is now a perfect multiple of R1, in which case this is zero, and in that case you'd stop the Euclidean algorithm here, or uh, again you can say that the Euclidean size function of R2, F of R2 here, is strictly less than F of R1, okay? So I'll just underline the statement in purple. And again, you can end on this third line if it's the case that R0 is a perfect multiple of R1. If it's not the case, if R2 is non-zero, then you have to go on to another one, and that would involve R1 and R2. And again, uh, you'd go through the same process. If it's a perfect multiple, you'd stop, and that would be the end of the Euclidean algorithm. Or if it's not a perfect multiple, you'd go on to the next line, and the next, and the next, and it continues on and on and on, until you finally get to the point where you do have one of these remainders as the perfect multiple of the next. So what I can write is that Rm minus 1 is equal to qn plus 1 times rn, so I'm just matching the indexes up. Okay, so we'll call the final remainder here rn. Okay, uh, you can see that the index of the quotient is 1 higher than the thing there, so I've just put n plus 1 here, and the index here is 1 lower than there, so I've got n minus 1. Okay, uh, so I claim that eventually you must get to the end. Now, that's a big claim. Why must this end? Why can this not go on forever? Okay, well, this is the brilliance of the Euclidean domain. This tells me that it cannot go on forever, because remember, the Euclidean size function maps all elements of the Euclidean domain bar the additive identity onto a non-negative integer. Okay, the non-negative integers are bounded below. They do not get smaller and smaller and smaller forever. Zero is the smallest one. Here, these are getting repetitively smaller and smaller and smaller. That process, therefore, cannot go on forever. If it did go on forever, the remainders would be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, their Euclidean size functions would be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And remember, this is a strict less than. That cannot go on forever. You cannot keep finding non-negative integers that are smaller than the last. It must end, therefore, okay, because that cannot go on forever. So that's the brilliance of the Euclidean domain, that this Euclidean algorithm process must terminate. It cannot go on forever. So you must finally get to uh, this line here, where one of the remainders is an exact multiple of the others, other, because it cannot simply go on forever. Okay, so just to make this a little bit more intuitive, I will put the line that would have been in front of this one. So what you'd have above this, the line above this, would have been that Rn minus 2 was equal to Qn here times Rn minus 1 plus this last remainder that we're going to bother to create, which is Rn here. And then what you'd have moved on to is saying, okay, if rn minus 2 was not an exact multiple of rn minus 1, then rn uh, was um, non-zero. So what we can now do is apply the division algorithm to rn minus 1 with rn here, and then we'd uh, find that rn minus 1 is an exact multiple of rn. And then we'd finish our Euclidean algorithm. Then we'd be finished. Now, what's the special number that comes out of this? Well, I claim that the very special number that comes out of this is this Rn here, this final remainder. Okay, this is going to be a very special number, and I claim, although I will explain exactly why this is true in a moment, that this is the greatest common divisor 
of A and B. Okay, so this is why we are bothering to do this, why we are bothering to study this, because this does actually spit out a number that we are interested in here, the greatest common divisor of A and B. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, before I actually explain to you why this number that it spits out is the greatest common divisor of A and B, what I want to do is actually do an example of applying the Euclidean algorithm, because when you see this in this form, it looks intimidating. In the abstract, non-concrete form, in the general form, it looks intimidating, but it's incredibly easy. So I want to give you a concrete example. Okay, I was taught this um, you know, when you were four, when I was 14, okay, in the context of the integers, okay, so it's not a difficult thing, okay, but when you see it like this, it does look complicated. So let's do a concrete example in our favourite Euclidean domain, which is the integers. Okay, so let's just pick some arbitrary numbers, so I'll pick the arbitrary number 342, and as my other uh, number I'll have, what shall I have, 126, let's go for. Okay, right. So, I'm going to set A equal to 324 and B equal to 126. However, you could do it the other way around. I want to stress that you don't need to make A the bigger one and B the smaller one. You can do it either way around. The division algorithm doesn't say that you have to make A the bigger one and B the smaller one. Okay, not at all. You can do it the other way around if you like, and I urge you to have a go at doing it the other way around. Uh, but I'm going to do it uh, with A equal to this one. So A is equal to this one, and B is equal to 126. Right, okay, so let's try and write the first line here then. So 342, and I need to write it as some multiple of 126. Okay, so damn, I have to actually do arithmetic. Uh, so, which multiple of 126? Okay, so I want the smallest multiple of 126, which is less than this. Okay, of course I could go above and then add on a negative remainder, but to keep it simple, let's just add on a positive remainder. So let's go to the left. So I think it's going to be 2 here, so we'll have 2 times 126, 2 times times 126 will give us 252, so I'll just jot that down, so 252 here, so we now need to subtract that off, that's nice and easy, uh, so it'll be plus 90 here I believe. Okay, right, uh, so uh, now what we do, and I'll just highlight things in here, so this is our A, okay, here, um, this is our B, 126 here, Q0 is our 2 here, which we're multiplying by B, and 90 is our R0, okay? Right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to then use this one and this one now, and we're going to apply the division algorithm to them. So we'll write 126 here, okay, so again I'll colour it in. So we've got 126 here, so that will be underlined in red here. Right, and now I want to write it as some multiple times 90, so I'll go for 1 times 90. 1's a perfectly valid thing to use here, so Q1 now is going to be 1 here. Okay, at 90 I've got here, this is my R0, and then I need my R1, my remainder here, which is going to be plus 36. Okay, so excellent, I've now got an R on my second line here, and of course we have to continue because uh, this is not a perfect multiple of 90. Okay, so we've got a non-zero remainder again, so we have to continue on. Okay, so we go on to our third line now, so we write 90 as a multiple of 36. Okay, so we apply the division algorithm, it's not a perfect multiple again, so we're going to have to do no more work. Okay, so it'll be 2 times 36, I think, which will give me 72, and then I'll have to add on 18 here. Okay, and then we'll continue on to the next line, and now it ends, you see, because look, 36, and I'll continue highlighting it in because it was easier when I was highlighting it in. So 90 was my R0 here, okay, 36 was my R1 in pink there, okay, here was my Q2, which was 2 again, so I'll highlight that, that in orange here, and R2, my new remainder, Okay, my final remainder indeed uh, is here in purple. Okay, so 36 will then be 2 times 18. 
So in this case, Rn would be 2. So I'd end my second remainder here, or my third remainder, depending on how you view it, because I call 1 the 0 of 1, uh, is my final remainder that I bothered to create. I don't create any more. And you can see that 36 is a perfect multiple of this. So this is the final number. And indeed, this will actually be the greatest common divisor of these two things, although we haven't proven that yet. Okay, but it will be. Uh, that's the greatest number that divides both of these. You can't find any larger number that divides both of them. Okay, so there's an example of doing the Euclidean algorithm for two numbers in the integers. Okay, so what we now want to understand is why this number that it spits out, this final remainder, is going to be the greatest common divisor uh, of uh, the two uh, numbers that you started off with, A and B here. Okay, so firstly what I want to do is remind you of the definition of greatest common divisor because it's a complicated definition so it deserves restating. Okay, and then what we'll do is try and prove this. Okay, so let's take two elements then. So let's take A and B, which are elements of uh, my Euclidean domain, and again I will uh, pick them so that they're not zero, okay? It just becomes trivial when one or both of them is equal to zero. So let's keep with non-zero elements. So I pick A and B, which are elements of my um, integral domain here, or indeed you don't actually even need it to be an integral domain. You can do this in just an arbitrary commutative ring, but we're working in a Euclidean domain, so we might as well uh, keep it as such. Okay, uh, so a greatest common divisor then, so I'll call my greatest common divisor D. So let's say the greatest common divisor of these two can be notated by this letter D. Okay, and the definition then of a greatest common divisor of these two elements of my uh, Euclidean domain, or indeed of my commutative ring, is that it's a common divisor. Okay, and what that means is it has to divide both of them. Okay, so it has to be the case that some multiple of D is equal to A and some multiple of D is equal to B. So both A and B have to be multiple of D, multiples of D. And that can be nicely stated as the ideal that contains both A and B, the smallest ideal that contains A and B, the ideal generated by A and B, uh, has to be completely contained within the principal ideal generated by D here. Okay, so that's the common divisor criterion. That's uh, the nice way of stating that uh, A and B both have to be multiples of D. So that's criterion number one. And then the second criterion refers to the greatest portion here. Okay, the greatest portion means that if you have any other divisor uh, that also divides A and B, so uh, for all, um, let's say D prime is an element of our Euclidean domain, uh, such that, okay, such that d prime is also a common divisor. So d prime divides a, and uh, d prime divides b. Or alternatively, again, we could state it that um, the domain, sorry, the ideal generated by a and b must be contained within uh, the principal ideal generated by d prime. So if you take any other common divisor of a and b, it must be the case that the principal ideal generated by the greatest common divisor must be completely contained within the principal ideal generated by the other divisor, other common divisor. Okay, so the principal ideal generated by D must be completely contained within the principal ideal generated by D prime. Okay, so that's the definition uh, of a greatest common divisor that all the other common divisors um, are uh, actually divisors of the greatest common divisor. So the greatest common divisor must be a multiple of all the other common divisors. Hence, its principal ideal must be generated by it, must be completely contained within the principal ideals of all other common divisors. Okay, uh, so we'll have a little break there, and in the next video, what I will do is prove that this number that we end up with at the end of the Euclidean algorithm is actually going to be the greatest common divisor of A and B.